Welcome to the Healing Trauma Podcast, a space for those who are healing from complex and developmental trauma. Introducing your host, Monique Coven, a certified trauma recovery coach, survivor, and thriver. The intent of the podcast is to provide helpful information with insight that can validate, encourage, and support you on your healing journey. You're going to hear stories from other survivors and trauma experts, featuring therapists, coaches, and practitioners. We will open up the conversation on effective trauma healing modalities, practices, and tools. If you are interested in trauma recovery coaching, as well as recommended books and healing resources, head over to www.thehealingtraumapodcast.com. And now, here is your host, Monique Coven. Welcome back, everyone. So on today's episode, I'm sitting down with Mark Odland, and Mark is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He is also an artist and a poet, and we're going to be talking about his latest book, which is called EMDR Inspired Art and Poetry, A Meditation on Hope and Pain for Troubled Times. And so I loved this book because when I read it, the pieces that he wrote were very touching and really touched me deeply. And he also used some of his creativity in the artwork that that coincided with what he was writing. So it was just a beautiful experience. So we're going to be talking about different themes um, that come up with healing. And I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Mark. Welcome, Mark, to the podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yes, I am. I'm looking forward to talking about your book um, and talking a little bit about EMDR and trauma and trauma therapy and being a therapist because yeah. you are an EMDR therapist. You're also an artist and a poet. And I really enjoyed your book. I I was really moved by a lot of the a lot of the poetry and also the the art that went with it was very moving. So I'm hoping that we can we can dive into it a little bit. But yeah. let me just start by asking you, why did you decide to write this book? Yes, great question. Um, so in addition to being an EMDR therapist, and for those who aren't familiar, that that stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, and it's one of, uh, one of several, uh, one of some of the big trauma therapies out there that have been proven to really help people. And what's kind of unique about EMDR is you pull up the trauma and in this kind of very standard protocol, and it, it involves eye movements back and forth or buzzers back and forth that someone's holding in their hand or even tapping. So that left, right stimulation, somehow we, we're, we have our theories about what exactly is happening, but we know that it, it seems to help calm traumatic memories down. And it seems to unlock the brain's ability to kind of sync up with truthful, adaptive, uh, comforting and healing material that might be cut, cut off from the original trauma. And so, um, so I've, I've been an EMDR therapist for quite a while now, and I've been passionate about that because I saw such powerful healing with my clients and, uh, have gone through a couple rounds of it myself as a client. So, um, uh, trying to practice what I preach by, mm -hmm. <laughs> by mm -hmm. doing the work myself. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I would say EMDR is one of my passions. Um, and then as a former, uh, art and religion major, kind of my journey is always, uh, along the way prompted me to think about how things like spirituality and creativity could kind of enter into that process. And so that artist in me is always looking for ways to express myself. And so back to your question, why did I write the book? I think it was a time where I've been really busy. I've been feeling kind of burned out uh, from all the trauma work I've been doing with people, mm -hmm. starting to feel some of that compassion fatigue coming on, which didn't feel good. Um, 
it kind of snuck up on me in, a little, in some ways. And so I think beginning the book was a way, it was a kind of therapy mm-hmm. for myself. So the act of writing the poems and kind of finding the metaphors and finding those words to describe these experiences that I've had as a therapist and as a client, um, I think was really helpful for me. A, a kind of a, a way of processing through my own stuff and then through the illustrations as well. So in the book, um, every poem, it's a short poem, one poem on each page is paired with an illustration that goes with it. And so for me, that was just a, a really helpful part of expressing myself as a creative person and also helping myself kind of heal through burnout and then hoping that it might be a blessing to others as well. Um, but if nothing else, it was it was something that I needed to do for me. Mm. Yeah, I I loved it because you gave words to to what like someone, for example, is one that's mm-hmm. coming to my mind for a person, the experience of what it's like to go for therapy and all the emotion involved and all of the feelings in the body of like, Oh my gosh, do I have to touch this thing that I want to forget? And yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. I have several poems that kind of touch on that theme of what it's like for clients to start therapy and just, Mm -hmm. I can just see it in their body. Like the apprehension of like, there's a part of them that knows like I need this. Yeah. This is why I'm here. And this other part of them that's just really understandably apprehensive. Yep. And as, as you know, when it comes to straight up PTSD, sometimes just the old adage, you know, things like, oh, it'll just get better with time. Or if you just, mm. just talk about it um, off the cuff, sometimes people feel worse afterwards. It just stirs the mm-hmm. whole yeah. hurt up. And so um, they don't know that, this could be a safe space to really work through stuff. And, and, um, and I think this one poem I'm thinking of uh, titled blocking belief, Uh, blocking belief is a term in EMDR therapy where someone has an old lie that's kind of connected Mm -hmm. to their trauma. That's just deeply embedded Mm -hmm. in their body and their psyche. And that negative belief um, almost needs to be addressed sometimes before the deeper trauma processing can happen because it just seems to kind of be like this barrier, this, this, this thing that's getting in the way from the breakthrough. And so this poem titled blocking belief uh, kind of gets at what it's, what it was like for me as a therapist to see these clients who don't recognize their own strength, Mm -hmm. who don't see their own resiliency yet and how it's kind of almost painful and tragic in a way as a therapist to see that in someone and, they haven't seen it for themselves yet, yeah. but there's that hope that we, we can get there together, right? Um, yeah. So here, here's the poem, Blocking Belief. If only she could feel in her bones the strength and worth that I see. If only she could shatter the wall and as the dust clears, know that she's free. Old lies stacked like bricks, rough hewn. Truth interwoven like a resurrected tomb. Rejection, a hard, a fast hardening cement. Her heart now adapting to compassion's descent. I love that one. And I bookmarked that particular poem because it was so beautiful. And it is, it's the experience that I too witness with my own clients. When sure. you're seeing the beauty in front of you, but you're seeing the pain of those what you described, those lies that we take on as children and carry that. And then you're seeing it with love. They're not seeing it. But then when their eyes meet your eyes of compassion and they, you can see that they're taking that in. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Well, thank you. And that the illustration um, that goes with it is just a close up of of a person's eye. Ah, Yes. it's kind of, and with the MBR, of course, the eye movement, you know, the eyes being the window to the soul kind of thing. Like there is something about the eyes. Um, yes, yes, that's, yes. That reflects a lot. Yeah. You know what just came to my mind, Mark? I'm just thinking about um, the actual experience of trauma, especially mm-hmm. in the 
in the core of the overwhelm, often we are, our eyes are looking to attach to a safe person's eyes and we didn't have that. And so this idea of then in therapy, having that safe eyes to attach to is, uh, it's like the experience is finally met. Mm. Yeah, exactly. No, that, that's a, that is so important. And I, I've, I found that doing the EMDR work that I do that, you know, as part of the resource building and, and preparation work, even if they've had a lot of trauma in their life, if they can remember at least one person in their life who showed them kindness, you know, it might've been a teacher, it might've been an aunt, it might've been a grandparent. Um, that's a resource we go back to when things get hard, when things get stuck as a, as a reminder of that truth that they do matter, that they are lovable, that, you know, mm-hmm. those things. And, and then maybe part of what I think about what, what you were saying too, is some people have been through so much, they don't even have that one person. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Right. And I know so then, I didn't. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then, then, then it becomes spiritual figures. It becomes the compassion in the room with mm-hmm. your therapist or with yeah. your coach or with your, you this person mm-hmm. that's going to help. Um, and, uh, and then the nervous system miraculously starts to rewire itself. Yes. <laughs> That's just yes. so such a privilege to uh huh to watch that. that. Yeah. yeah, I know. I like you and I both. Our eyes are getting really big because yep. <laughs> because you know as trauma as trauma survivors ourselves, um, you know that feel we know what it's like on both sides. So yeah, yeah. the other thing that uh, you talked about was like the power of lies and insecurities. But you also talked about our tendency to avoid thinking about the trauma, which is the basis of avoidance, so that we don't have to feel you wrote a poem about that, too. But what can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah, it, I think that that avoidance, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's one of those things where I don't, I don't really I don't have a spirit of judgment about it when I, mm-hmm. I feel that from a client, because I know that that part of them has had to protect themselves and ke- keep those memories at bay for all these years for, for a good reason. And mm-hmm. it's probably worked pretty well up until now. And so um, even though I'm not like uh, certified in, in like internal family systems theory or anything like that, I mean, it's kind of inevitable when you do trauma work that you start working with parts or different ways of looking at the inner child. And um, a helpful metaphor that I got along the way from one of my trainings was this idea that, you know, there tends to be a wounded kid inside all of us or most of us um, that had to take on a big responsibility of finding a way to cope and survive. And um, sometimes that little kid is still in the driver's seat when things get stressful and the grown adult in the office isn't even aware that this is kind of a wounded part of self that um, is taking out, has taken on a job that's way too big for them for all these years. Mm-hmm. And that little kid inside just doesn't know that it's over, um, doesn't know that it's safe yet, doesn't know that it's okay to heal, doesn't know that they're all grown up with a grown up body. Um, and that's the, the kind of the art and the nuance of some of the trauma work is you have kind of the skeleton of the, you know, the therapeutic approach that you have, but then there's that kind of beautiful, artful, nuanced work with the individual sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, I think the avoidance is really natural. Um, And uh, sometimes it becomes this little dance, I think, (laughs) with me. Uh, uh, Not always, but oftentimes I have to confess it's guys like myself who are pretty convinced they don't need it, don't need the EMDR, they, they, <laughs> you know, and they've got lots of reasons why. And the thing that's interesting is I feel like I can get, a, I can kind of see right through it. Mm-hmm. And I see the need, I see the hurt. And I'm just hoping that in kind of that dance of that negotiation that we're doing as we're kind of building trust in the relationship that when the timing is right and when they feel strong enough, they will give it a try. And they, they will do the work. And so I guess in a nutshell, I can't blame people if they're not ready, but I feel like the two of us hopefully can get to a place where they are ready as they build their kind of um, capacity. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So another theme in your book is um, interesting. It, it's like the insecurities are kind of like the inner dialogue that was going on with you 
as a uh, therapist. So would you be willing to share a little bit about what was happening within you? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, man, that would be an entertaining uh, podcast inside the heads of therapists, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just all the things that are running through our minds. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, the truth of the matter is we're, we're all human, right? As therapists and we get, we get triggered. And when we do, we try to hide it the best we can. So it doesn't interfere with therapy. And if it starts to interfere with therapy, then that's a big signal that it's time to do more work for ourselves, I think. And um, so for me, I, after doing over a decade of, you know, 30 clients a week, EMDR, intense trauma therapy and holding it together pretty well, I feel like it just, it hit me hard pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And I felt myself feeling kind of numb, uh, feeling less empathy for people, for my clients, feeling less compassion, mm -hmm. feel, even feeling kind of some avoidance and even some dread. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd look at my caseload and think about the pain that my clients were going through and to enter into that with them is in a way to suffer with them. And if, and, and depending on where you're at with your self-care and your own boundaries and your own um, burnout, yeah. it can become kind of dicey. So for me, that was happening. And then COVID hit. <laughs> And so, COVID. and then so many of us, right, we're kind of scrambling and working through making sense of all this. And my wife and I had to transition our, our group practice to completely telehealth during that time. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of feeling the weight of responsibility for us and for our clients. And, uh, and then on top of it all, my, my father was slowly dying from uh, chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And so you know, he only died about five and a half months ago. And so all those things kind of came together as this perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, the inner dialogue for me was kind of my body uh, screaming, get me out of here. <laughs> like, yeah. like it was just too much. It, it was too much. So, um, uh, 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 gonna, Gabor Mate, who, mm -hmm. who the body says no, I, I, he was a keynote speaker at one of the EMDR conferences a while back. And I, I use his work often to describe how important it is to listen to our bodies. And when your body's screaming no, mm -hmm. but your mouth says yes, <laughs> then something's going to give, right? It's going to catch up with you. And um, so for me, what that looked like is uh, I ended up having to take a step back. And although it was very hard for me, I ended up taking kind of a sabbatical from seeing my own clients mm -hmm. and uh, going to a retreat with my wife for burnout, um, finding my own spiritual director, um, really trying to reset things a little bit for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of in my, kind of in my heart, my spirit, I kind of had this sense that I was going to need this time to recover from the burnout, to grieve my dad's death. Mm -hmm. And so between those things and writing the book, and um, I think that was all really necessary. Mm -hmm. And I won't say that I'm kind of completely through it yet, but I'm finding that I'm at a place now where I'm kind of, I feel like I'm kind of getting to the top of the hill and I'm almost coming down on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not arrived, but kind of feeling like, okay, I'm kind of excited about doing more therapy again. I'm kind of excited about helping other therapists heal from burnout I'm kind of excited about mm -hmm. the, the, the populations that keep coming to mind for me are burned out pastors and burned out therapists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's the little glimmer on the horizon that, that's exciting for me. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. The inner dialogue of a therapist. It's, <laughs> I think for me, it was just <laughs> screaming. I, I kind of, as much as I care about my clients and it was kind of like, I need to, something needs to change. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the reality of um, being used to, especially as a child to just um, disconnect from what we're feeling. So if we're tired and exhausted and can't do it anymore, well, just push that aside and keep going. But yeah. like, the, like you said, the body just, you know, gets to a point where it can't, it will show up physically or in some way. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's uh and I, I found that too. I've heard from massage therapists and people that, you know, the body stores, right. And we found this as trauma therapists too. Right. I mean, you know, where you, I would think I was more, I had got a weird back injury, mm -hmm. you know, all the time mm -hmm. after my dad died. And I just, I just know that um, so much of it's connected. You know? Yeah, definitely. If you'd like to find out more about trauma recovery coaching with me, 
you can visit my website at thehealingtraumapodcast.com. There you'll find a variety of ways that we could work together. So what's it like for a therapist, like for a therapist to start EMDR with a new client? This could be helpful also even for a client who's considering EMDR. Yeah, so EMDR has eight phases. So people who know about EMDR think about the eye movements. That's what kind of makes it different. Yeah. Uh, but what people don't realize is when they come in, the first couple sessions, uh, it's just getting to know the person, getting to know their story, building some trust. Um, we're trained as EMDR therapists not to kind of open up deep the trauma quite yet. We just want to kind of get the bullet points to kind of get a lay of lay of the land and overview of the kinds of things you've been through uh, as a client. Um, And then, and then it goes into the preparation phase after we're done with history taking. And the preparation phase is really kind of assessing the client's ability to regulate their own emotions. Right. And so in EMDR, we're trained to do something called a safe place or a calm place exercise where you find your happy place and it's reinforced with some slow eye movements that have a calming effect. And the idea is to train your brain to be able to just bring up a key word that signifies this beautiful place, the mountain stream or, the, you know, the, yeah. the walk in the woods or, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And to be able to notice your body shift gears. And then we test it, right? Test it with, think about something stressful, notice where you feel it. And now when you're ready, say your safe place out loud or your, they went away from using the word safe place and used and changed it to calm place for, because some people, the word safe is actually triggering, which I thought was kind of interesting yeah. because there never was a safe place for them. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, so I think what to expect is that uh, a well-trained EMDR therapist will try to recognize where you're at and what you're ready for. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that you've been through a lot of hard things in your life, sometimes you might not be able to jump into the eye movements right away. Yeah. 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 It might, it might take, you know, weeks. It might even take months depending on what you've been through. And sometimes that involves uh, some ego state or kind of parts Mm -hmm. work on the front Mm -hmm. side. Sometimes it involves practical coping strategies Mm -hmm. and education. Mm -hmm. Um, And then at some point, we uh, go after the trauma. And what that looks like is there's a the therapist has developed a list of kind of like, here are the foundational traumas that you've experienced throughout your life, going back all the way to childhood and into the present. And, um, and what connects all those memories, um, kind of like a string of pearls or like people put Cheerios on the fishing line or whatever for a, on the Christmas tree or whatever it is. The, the common thread is usually a core lie. I'm not good enough, Mm -hmm. I'm not safe, or I'm worthless, or I'm helpless, or whatever that is. And for most people, most people are really surprised to find that that common thread runs through all of their deepest hurts. And it's not always the case. Sometimes there's, you know, dealing with self-worth issues, and there's just been safety issues, you know. Um, But uh, typically, then we work chronologically from beginning the touchstone memory is that earliest memory. Um, and the power of EMDR is sometimes people will come in as a grown adult with something they're really struggling with, right? The stress in their marriage or their mean boss or whatever it is. And you start with the memory from age four or five years old and you reprocess that memory to completion within a session or two where you can think about the memory and it feels calm. You can think about the, what the truth about who you are when you think about that memory, uh, some people will report after it's healed that it feels kind of further away mm-hmm. or, or, or uh, fuzzy in a way. And the, the miraculous thing is sometimes when they work through that early stuff, then they come back the next week or two and they, you ask them how things were at work or how things are going with their spouse. And they're like, oh my gosh, it doesn't bother me anymore <laughs> the same way. Mm-hmm. And it's because the thing with the boss or with the spouse was stirring up that old lie that goes all the way back to age five that cemented in that nervous system response, right? Um, I worked with a Vietnam veteran once who uh, we worked on a memory from his childhood 
And then he came back a week or two later and said, this is the first week in 40 years. I haven't had a nightmare about the war. So who would think that there'd be that such a, such a strong connection between what happened at age four and him having combat nightmares. And so, so yeah, that was kind of a, a long response to that. But I think, I think what a client can expect is that it'll be paced according to kind of what you can handle, mm -hmm. but it won't just be talk therapy either. Um, sometimes really compassionate, uh, good therapists before they got trained in EMDR will kind of go back to talk therapy mm -hmm. and then you'll, you'll kind of lose uh, track of where you're at in the EMDR process. And so if you are used to talk therapy, which is powerful, EMDR might feel a little different because it, it can be, it can be kind of focused on like, okay, um, now we're back to this memory where we left off last week. And um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking um, a couple of things. I'm thinking about how I think a lot of people think that they, you, when you do EMDR, you get right into the processing. <laughs> so I, I'm glad that you explained the phases. Yeah. And, and I tell people too, if you don't get there right away, it's not that you've done something wrong or anything like anything's wrong with you. It just means for whatever reason, your nervous system, because of what you went through, isn't quite ready yeah. to tolerate that amount of trauma yes. pre-processing yet. Yeah. And that's the word yet. Um, but when it is, then, then things can go a lot smoother. Um, one, of, one trainer put it this way. They said something like the, sometimes the fastest way to get to the goal is to take it slow. And mm -hmm. so it just depends on the person. Yeah. That's that slower is faster. Um, yeah. What I've heard now, a question I had for you too, is what happens if you have a client that doesn't have a lot of memories? Cause a lot of people don't have a lot of childhood memories per se. Yeah. How do you work with that? That that's a great question. Um, well, you know, one thing that we can do that sometimes is revealing is, and it's not unique to EMDR, but we do something called a float back technique, mm -hmm. where you have them focus on something that bothers them in the present. You have them notice what the lie is, where they feel the stress in their body, and then you have them close their eyes and just kind of float back or drift back to an earlier time in their life where they felt that the same way. And whatever pops into their head, it's not by accident. Mm -hmm. They tell you, oh, I just thought about college. This thing happens. And then I write it down. Mm -hmm. It's a memory target now. And then I start over. I shine the spotlight on the college memory. Okay. Notice the lie. Notice where you feel that in your body. Now just let it float back to time that even earlier in your life. And then, oh, man, that's weird. I was in kindergarten. And I had to say the alphabet and I got scared and froze. Then this person made fun of me and okay, here we go. There's another one. And then those tend to be out of all the th thousands or millions of memories our brain is holding. Again, it's not an accident that those ones just popped up. Yeah. And then I th say the other side of it would be if someone may have had to dissociate or separate themselves from those memories because as a way of coping. Yeah, it's too much. And it's too much. And if that's the case, then again, it just, it probably means a longer preparation phase. Mm -hmm. uh, again, maybe some parts work, maybe different things to do to uh, maybe convince that part of them who's in charge of kind of keeping the memories locked down safe mm -hmm. that now is, you know, to convince that protective part that this might actually be worth it. This might actually be helpful and healing. And, um, the status quo actually is doing some harm too, right? Just not, you know, so it's, it's kind of, again, that, and this idea that we have all these kind of parts inside of us that make us complex mm -hmm. and uh, all it takes is one tough part of us to shut the whole thing down. Yeah. And so there has to be a sense of kind of agreement within mm -hmm. the whole person that like, it, it changes how, what, how we think of informed consent, right? Because yeah. the person nodding their head in your office it doesn't mean that every part of them is really okay with jumping to it yet. That's right. right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. There could be a part of them that's like, okay, uh, many of us have gone through that. Okay. Okay. Let's get to it. I want to heal. Come on. And then there's a part like, mm, I'm not going there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes memories are hard to uncover. And it's sometimes they just work with what I've got, right? If they just, if we have to work with just present stuff that's stressful, hey, that can be our starting place. Yeah. But I will just tell people that the, the eye movements are powerful in how they can just, it, your brain can take you places you didn't expect. Wow. 
And so I say, we can start in the present, mm -hmm. but there is always the possibility that when you start that, your mind might drift to something unexpected. And we just want to, again, make sure that your nervous system feels like, okay, if that happens, we can do these exercises, you can calm your body down, and you can leave the therapy session in a feeling like, okay, that was kind of hard, but I feel strong, I feel calmer now, and I can face my week. Yes, yes, so good. So what else would you like to talk about, um, you know, as we're moving through this conversation? Yeah, yeah, I think the thing that keeps bubbling up for me is just this, uh, just this sense of the more I talk to other therapists, the more it's, it's, it's rare to find someone who hasn't felt a little burned out at some point. Mm. And um, so I, I think what's been a beautiful thing for me is when I'm hearing from other therapists who have read the book, they're seeing a lot of themselves and pieces of it mm -hmm. uh, here and there. And, um, and I think the other thing that I've, people have appreciated is me trying to kind of lay it out there with my own experience, um, which is exciting for me being a creative person, but also kind of slightly terrifying to like expose yourself yeah. that way. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, through things like poetry <laughs> and art, you're kind of like, yeah, here, here's all the reasons that I'm not perfect as a therapist. Here's all the... <laughs> Insecurity. Insecurity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, I did believe in um. What's that thing when you feel like you're a counterfeit? You oh, wrote about that. Yeah, yeah, you wrote about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think, I think that part. Um, but I think by facing it, it's kind of like shame too, right? I feel right. like if you can kind of name it and yeah. uh, not keep it in the shadows, mm -hmm. uh, it can take the power away from it. And just uh, connecting to this is a universal experience yes. for, being, for being human. Human. I was thinking the same thing. I don't know, but I, when I was a, you know, a young person going for therapy at the beginning, I really thought therapists were super human. Uh, they can experience any emotion and just be completely grounded. I had no idea that they were human too. Oh, man. Yeah, it's... Uh... <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's so right, right? It, it's so it's so funny how that works. The, the pedestal that we put people on sometimes, and uh, I can't remember if it was if we had talked about this or if it was someone else. But the idea that many of us find our way into this profession yeah. subconsciously, kind of working through our own stuff yeah. too, yeah. you know, working out our own child, you know, family of origin stuff, and yeah. I'm, there might be something to that. I mean. My dad, uh, I come from a line of doctors and pastors, and uh, my brother is a neuropsychologist. My mom was a psych, my, a psych major. It's so it's, it's very interesting, and then um, it's interesting how all that works. But I think um, so. I think yeah, vulnerability, as as painful as it is, I think there's a lot of healing that can come through that. Um, and so I've been encouraged. I, I've been encouraged by that, and. Um, and excited to keep learning more about that as well as, as I um, help others work through that and continue mm -hmm. to work through that myself as well. But um, I think it's, I think it's so needed because it's one of those things where the metaphor on the airplane of put on the, put on your own oxygen mask first before mm -hmm. you can help other people mm -hmm. get ready. Yeah. Um, I do kind of feel like I have this privileged position of being able to really impact the world in a, in a really positive way. And um, if I'm depleted and kind of out of commission, then it's, it's not, I'm not fulfilling that potential and I'm not like seeing that, you know, those ripple effects happen in the world. And so um, one of the scariest uh, prayers that I came across was something like, God, please increase my capacity to endure more suffering with other people. Mm. You know, that's kind of a hard one because it's yeah. kind of like especially when you're feeling burned out, you want to get away from that. Yeah. But I guess what I realized is it's when your cup is already full of stress and then it's overflowing, yeah. then it feels overwhelming. But if, but if the stress rises up and then there's a way to drain that back out, yes, exactly. then you can keep refilling it and you can, the, you know, the root of the word compassion is to suffer with. Um, yes. So how do you do that in a way without losing yourself? How do you not fall into it and still keep your boundaries? And exactly. Still take care of yourself. And um, so, yeah, I think whoever's listening who is experiencing that as a therapist or just a person going through the pandemic and life and 
mm-hmm. finances and just all these things that are happening in our world. It's like, yeah, you're, you're not alone with that. And it's very human. And if you're feeling kind of burned out and stressed out, you're join the club because it's, it's pretty, pretty normal. And there, there is, there is help out there. And um, there, there really can be profound healing too. Yeah, that's, that's just so hopeful. And I think that's, that's why I like, that's why I love this podcast, not my podcast per se, but just the fact that we're speaking about hope because people who come from trauma have lived with hopelessness and helplessness and powerlessness and no way out and knowing that, yes, there are ways to heal is, oh yeah, it's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you so much for sharing and for being vulnerable with all of us. And that encourages us to be vulnerable with other people. So thank you. And I will link your book to the um, show notes so people can have a look at your book and your website and, and all of that good stuff. Yeah, well, sounds good. Well, thank you so much for the, the chance to talk with you. It's been a, been a joy and thanks for the good work you're doing.